What do you think about Jesus Christ? I'd be fascinated to hear what you think about um, him. I think at the base he was a strong, influential political leader whose message could be taken entirely, most of it, not the whole kingdom of God part, but the, most of it could be interpreted without necessarily believing that he had any, pow any ability beyond that of a great order. Okay, what about his claims to be God in human form? What about the way the Gospels are obviously not biographies, they focus an incredible amount of attention on his death on the cross. What about the Gospel record of his rising from the dead? What do you make of all of that? I don't know that those were written during the period when he was actually alive. There's actually evidence that those were written well after. On top of that, there are dozens of other non-canonical Gospels which have great variance in them among, about what exactly happened during his life and what what exactly happened during his and what he said. Okay, but the evidence is that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were written in the first century. Okay. That eyewitnesses who had seen Christ were around when the Gospels were written. They could have contradicted them, obviously. But obviously, the followers of Christ grew in number as more and more eyewitnesses in the first century <laughs> shared their historical record of Christ and their personal faith in Christ. Then the Gnostic Gospels, the non-canonical Gospels, started cropping up, but they were rejected because they were based on Gnostic philosophy. So, I mean, you've got a pretty clear historical record there of Jesus of Nazareth. In fact, we live in the year 2010, right? That has a kind of. bit to do with, you know, Jesus well, there, Christ there being other, born. There are other calendars, though, also. Yeah, but just saying that the one we hold calendar. to is based on when Christ was born, right? Yeah. So obviously he was an historical person, and as an historical person he made some incredible claims. To be God in human form, to die on a cross for our sins, the resurrection points to that being reliable, kind of weighty evidence that he's more than just a political figure, he claimed to be God in human form, and we locked the majority of those people up in mental hospitals. So the question is, is Jesus Christ a candidate for a mental hospital? Or is he someone who we should worship and put our faith in? And I would maintain the resurrection from the dead is evidence that we should put our faith in him. Where is justice? What is mercy? Where is the sacred and the holy? Choices. Where's the truth in all the voices? Give me an answer. Don't waste my time. Tell it to me straight. The truth is getting hard to find. I have objections to what I've learned. I have questions and concerns. Give me an answer. There's not much evidence of, the, of that outside of the, the Gospels themselves. Right. There aren't any non-Christian articles or that much in, in that area that would confirm that outside of what was written by the faithful, those who already were of the mentality that that was, that was what happened, that was the historical fact of the incident. Okay. But the most famous person of Jesus' day was Tiberius Caesar. Within a period of 150 years, 10 people wrote about Tiberius Caesar. Within a period of 150 years of Christ, 42 people wrote about Jesus Christ. So certainly we're not going to try and maintain that there's little historical evidence regarding Christ. There's a ton of historical evidence about Christ. It's kind of like a game of telephone, though. No. It's not telephone, uh-uh. -oh. Because we've got over 5,000 Greek manuscripts or pieces of manuscript of the Gospels agreeing to an infinitesimal degree. I mean, it's not telephone, man. This is historically reliable information passed down over 2,000 years. I don't know. I, I am kind of of the belief, though, that no document can be completely reliable, especially the farther back that you go, you go okay. from it. Because especially text text is written with a given objective and it's usually to persuade someone to believe what they already believe 
to tell people what they think is the truth. And if it's just one person's word, it's very difficult to verify that, especially the farther back you go, the farther back you go from people actually having witnessed whatever it is they're talking about. I'm, I'm also not denying the possibility that what you're saying is all completely true, but I can't, I, I, I'm dubious of it because I can't. <laughs> all right, well, just be consistent. Aristotle, Plato, Caesar, Tacitus, Thucydides, Herodotus. At the most, 20 extant manuscripts we possess of any one of their works. Time gap between when they wrote and the earliest manuscript. 700 to 1400 years. Jesus Christ. Gospels. Written within 20 to 60 years of him, not 700 to 1400. First manuscript, John Rylands University Library, Manchester, England, fragment of the Gospel of John, chapter 18. Dated 117 to 138 AD. That is 30 to 60 years after the writing. Very short gap, very close to the actual events recorded. You gotta take it seriously. Sure, there could be errors, but the manuscript evidence, the date of the writing of the document, the gap between when it occurred and when it was written, the gap between when it is written and the first manuscript that we have, the New Testament is supported far more solidly than any other document of its time. So if you're going to be consistent with your tests, goodbye Aristotle, Plato, Caesar, Tacitus, Thucydides, Herodotus. And it's entirely possible that all of those documents have as well undergone change, <laughs> considering that they're all being transcribed and copied by people who could just as easily go in and alter a word here or there and morph the text in some way. Anything's possible. The question is, what does the evidence point to? And I'm gonna follow the evidence. I'm not just gonna believe something because it's possible. The question is, what does the evidence point to? And the evidence is clear. Those documents are historically reliable. Based on manuscript evidence, archeology, span literary style, They're clear. But what is there in, in terms of physical evidence, not just people's writings, but what actual objects exist from that period? Is well, his, what is kind of cross? object are you looking for? I don't know. Uh, is the cross that he was nailed to still around? There's not much wood that was cut down. And there are some really old uh, pieces of wood that still exist, like stave churches. There are a lot less of them now because of people in Norway in the early 90s burning them, but... Right. No, I don't think we have the cross. Also. We don't have the cross. Is there anything, though? Because there, there are a lot of other things from that period that are still around. Well, sure. There's a ton of archaeological evidence that points us to the fact that Nazareth was a first century Palestinian town. Okay. So was Bethlehem. John chapter 5, scholars used to think that, ah, and just an example of John might, making it up. If I might add something, I'm not asking you this to dispute you, I'm asking this out of curiosity. Good distinction, thank you. The Pool of Siloam, recorded in John chapter five, where Jesus heals a paralyzed individual. It was thought, ah, there's a mistake. There's no pool in Jerusalem surrounded by five covered colonnades. But several years ago, archeologists uncovered that pool. It had a little stream coming down to it that was filled with a lot of dirt and the mud piled up and the pool was covered, but archaeologists uncovered it. So and all archaeology does is to verify the place names listed in those Gospels. Although the, the existence of the building itself doesn't necessarily verify that that particular event happened there. Correct. It could just as easily, or, well, one example that comes to mind is there are a lot of very specific geographical locations in, say, Limits Rob. That doesn't necessarily mean that Jean Valjean actually went there. Right. But the question is, are the Gospels historical fiction, which is a literary style? Well, <coughs> historical fiction was not a literary style used in the first century. 
There was a lot of exaggeration in a lot of historical documents from the period, usually biased towards those who had written it. <laughs> like if you look at the account of any any battle uh, from that period, the, the what, what the uh, winners of the battle would say had happened was usually a lot more violent and, 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 their, and glorious to them than what, say, those left over from the conquered would say happened. They might have thought that that was actually what happened, but that doesn't necessarily mean so. Well, historical fiction was not a literary style until hundreds of years after the first century. Not explicitly. Right. Mythology was. Yeah, exactly. And so the question is, are the Gospels mythology in their literary genre? And it's rather clear from reading Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John that they're not mythology. They are concerned with such questions as, at what time, in what place, with which individuals around, did this event take place? Uh, well, I would, say, I would say one thing that is morally absolute is uh, causing undue harm to others or uh, believing uh, uh, an innate superiority in one people over another. I would believe that would be immoral. And so Hitler's, uh, Hitler's actions were immoral because he killed millions of people and because he believed uh, Jews, homosexuals, gypsies, etc., to be inferior to the Aryan race. Okay, so you believe that there's a moral lawgiver? Uh, I, I don't know if I'd say that. Would it, if, are you asking if I believe that someone had to create these morals? Well, obviously someone had to create the morals, right? So who creates the morals? I, I think morals are a product of uh, one, our environment, and uh, two, our uh, an innate sense that we have. And I don't necessarily think that that was given to us by a creator. OK, well, then, in the innate sense that you have, does that tie you into an objective moral, or does it not? It does. Okay, so who creates and defines the object of moral that you hold to? I think it's a product of evolution and time. I think, like, for instance, me knowing not to hurt another human <coughs> being or not to murder another human being, that's something that society didn't need to teach me. That's something that I innately know as a human being, and I think that's a product of my, my brain in evolution creating a species that knows it's not going to be able to survive if it kills everybody that it sees. Okay, but if somebody else's brain, who has evolved to a different level than you, disagrees with what your brain tells you is moral, who is right, who is wrong? Um, well, I would say that they are immoral, but that would actually be pointing out why morality is kind of an abstract thing. Because sociopaths, no. for instance, don't have uh, any sense of morality. And uh, so, uh, in that, abstract, in that uh, sense, I guess, morality would be a... Uh, subjective, or uh, I get the two confused, actually, but uh, it's not necessarily uh, solid. Your relative, yeah. so I'm convinced that if there is no God, morality has to be relative. Because you, you can't have morality without a mind. And so if there is no God, there is no mind prior to the human mind, which means it's obviously the human mind that creates morality, if there is no God which means morality is totally relative, depending upon which human mind you're talking to. Sure. So that's why I don't understand why you're standing here saying what Hitler did was absolutely wrong. Well, I, I, I think that, um, sure, I'm saying what Hitler's doing was wrong. I'm saying that from a relative moral standpoint. Yeah. And uh, Maybe I can't say that from an absolute moral standpoint. Right. If I can't, it's because an absolute moral standpoint doesn't exist. But exactly. from uh, a relative moral standpoint that I can define in saying that harming other people, et cetera, what I was saying earlier, mm -hmm. um, I can say it's wrong. Sure. Uh, and in that, I don't see under what, what relative code you could say homosexuality is wrong. Well, sir, if morality is relative, nothing is absolutely right. Nothing is absolutely wrong. It's all relative. Sure. If that's your world view, try and live it out. I don't think you're going to be able to. I think instead you're going to do exactly what you just did, which is to say what Hitler did was absolutely wrong. Why? Because I'm convinced you do have a conscience. 
and I'm convinced that your conscience ties you into objective morals. Well, ask yourself, how can objective morals be real? Only if there is some type of moral lawgiver, some type of God to create and define those objective morals. I don't think that they're necessarily need. I mean, just because there's not an absolute thing and that people can't say that there's an absolute wrong, there's something that um, society can agree upon. And even if society agrees upon the wrong thing, it doesn't necessarily mean it's right. But um, sorry, I'm gonna go back. I, I well, why do you say that it has to be a god? Okay, I am convinced there has to be a god of some type because my experience of life is that if someone comes up to you and demeans you or shoots you or knifes you, I'm going to look them in the face and say, my conscience informs me that what you did to him is absolutely wrong. That was evil. When I look at Dachau and Auschwitz, I am convinced that is absolutely evil. Then I have to ask myself, how can there be a moral absolute? Only one way, if there is some type of God to create and define that moral absolute. So that is one of the pieces of evidence that points me to the existence of some type of God. Obviously, at this point in the discussion, Jesus Christ is irrelevant. Uh, we're not talking Jesus, we're talking God, right. theism. Yeah. Of course. Um, well, like, as I said, I would say that, like, the conscience that we have is a product of evolution. And if, um, and if, some, if people break that, uh, that mold of the conscience we have that says hurting other people, murdering other people is wrong, I mean, clearly we see that that's the outlier because we're saying that they're breaking the mold. The n majority of people that we, all the people here that have evolved have a conscience that tells them that murder is wrong, that hurting other people is wrong. And I would say that that's a product of evolution and not, necessar or, uh, not necessarily a product of a God that instilled that into us. Good. Then in 1924, when Hitler writes Mein Kampf, when Hitler writes, it is imperative that we not slow down the process of evolution by intermingling with inferior races. That is why we must get rid of the Jewish people because they are inferior and we must support evolution, the upward spiral. That's his take on social Darwinism. Right. He's not wrong, that, that's his take. You might disagree with him, but you're not right because it's all relative. What way would God reveal himself to somebody who had, who had no chance of ever, and never would hear anything about Jesus Christ? How would he reveal himself to them as God? Or know, how would they know God? Well, when you look at anthropology and history, obviously what has happened is God through creation has led people to realize, wow, there is a creator. Okay. Secondly, when you study anthropology, when you study people, what you see is deep within them, people have longed to know God. Okay. As G.K. Chesterton put it, the man who knocks on the door of a brothel is really looking for God. Meaning by that, I long for intimacy. I long for connection. I naturally ask the question, hey, anybody out there? Or am I alone in a cold, empty cosmos? We are hardwired in such a way right. that we search okay. for God. Okay, so you ask the question, it's natural. I, you know, I, yeah. I, I, I see exactly where you're coming from. But how do you get to know God? And I know you're going to say, Jesus, but what if you never hear about him? By his the spirit, message? God calls, draws you to himself. See? Abraham met a man named Melchizedek. Melchizedek knew God. He'd never heard about Yahweh Jehovah who would reveal himself to Abraham. So you can be a Christian without knowing anything about Jesus Christ. That's right. That's what you're saying. You can know God without knowing Christ. That's right. Abraham did, Moses did, Rahab did, <coughs> Noah did. But is that, I mean, so can you just relinquish all, everything we've been talking about, about the truths of what Jesus did and his resurrection, none of that matters at all anymore. Oh, no. 
You just said that it doesn't. That you can have. You can no, be a Thomas, Christian without Christ. No, Thomas. What I told you, Christ. sir, is I've had the privilege of meeting Thomas. If I say goodbye, we ain't talking anymore. I can do that and walk away. And I still have some knowledge of Thomas. But if I really want to develop a relationship with you, if I'm genuine in wanting to be your friend, I'm going to have to spend time with you. I'm going to have to listen, right. interact, build a relationship. Okay. That's the way we will d deepen our knowledge of each other. Okay, and you're saying that we do that through Christ. Exactly. God. Christ is God opening up and saying, here's more truth about me. Now, the disturbing thing about Jesus is, he says, and if you listen to me and don't like what you hear, your real problem is with God. If you see me and don't like what you see, your real problem is with God. An understanding of God's judgment deepens our appreciation for the love of God. But many people in our culture have a real problem with the idea of God judging evil. Many people in our culture have a real problem believing that God could create a hell. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 to 23, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will come to me on that day and say, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? In your name cast out demons and perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. It is possible to give lip service to Christ, while all the time being hard inside and unrepentant. When you begin to understand the goodness and the holiness, the justice of God, you begin to realize how you have fallen short of that standard, and you begin to realize your need of God's forgiveness. And that's why you begin to humble yourself and say, Lord Jesus, forgive me. When you begin to grapple with the depth of God's justice and His judgment of evil, then you're in a position to understand the depth of God's love for you as revealed in the cross of Jesus Christ. If I return home to an empty house, a friend comes out and says, Cliff, I was just visiting your house. Nobody was here, but I, I found a bill and I paid your bill for you. I will not know whether to shake his hand or kiss his feet. Why? Because I don't know the size of the bill that he paid for me. If he simply paid a 42 cent postage stamp, I will shake his hand and thank him. But if he paid, a humongous debt of mine, then I would be tempted to bow down before him and kiss his feet in gratitude. When you begin to understand the size of your debt to God, he gave you the gift of life, you blew it, you twisted it, you perverted it, you sinned, you've done wrong. When you begin to grapple with that, the debt that you owe him, and then you begin to grapple with the depth of his love for you that he sent his only son Christ to bleed and die on a cross to forgive you. When you grapple with those two facts, what that produces in, is a, in you is a deep love, a deep gratitude to Jesus Christ. Then you're able to sing from the depths of your being, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. You understand? That's why it's so important to understand the judgment of God towards evil. A second reason it's important to understand the judgment of God towards evil is expressed by that wonderful professor from Yale, Miroslav Volf, in his book, Exclusion and Embrace. Miroslav Volf grew up in the Balkans. He saw violence and retaliation, violence and retaliation, violence and retaliation. And Miroslav Volf, used his powers of keen observation to notice people who have no appreciation of the judgment of God find it very difficult to forgive, while those who understand and embrace the fact that God will judge evil are in a position to forgive more freely. Why? If there is no God of judgment, then evil wins and people get away with murder. But if there is a God of judgment, then it means that justice will win and injustice will ultimately lose. There is no future for evil if there is a God of judgment. If there is no God of judgment, there is a great future for evil. Evil people win the day and get away with murder. When you begin to understand that God will judge evil, then you begin to understand violence is wrong not just because it doesn't make sense. Violence is wrong because it violates the justice of God and God will punish evil. Then you're in a position to forgive other people for the dastardly things they do to you.
But when you forgive another person, you're not turning a blind eye to justice. You're saying justice will triumph. But the only one who is wise enough, good enough to be the judge is God. I forgive, but I'm trusting that God will make sure that justice ultimately wins in the end. You see, it's that appreciation of God's judgment, God's justice, that frees you and me then to forgive each other and refuse to enter the cycle of violence and retaliation. It is that understanding of the judgment of God that satisfies the deep longing that you and I have within us for justice to be honored. If there is no God of judgment, then justice is a joke. It's a relative ephemeral idea. It's a personal bias a personal prejudice. And Jesus Christ said, no, the God who created heaven and earth is a God who loves you. He's a God who is just. You and I have blown it. We've gotten alienated from God because of our wrongdoing, our participation in injustice. God loves us so much that he sent his only son, Christ, to bleed and die on a cross to forgive us and to reconcile us to God. Isn't it time for you to put your faith in Christ? Isn't it time for you to love Christ because of the amazing debt of yours that he paid when he bled and died on the cross for you? Grapple with that. And when you honestly grapple with the depth of his amazing grace, then your heart begins to trust in Christ. Then you begin to love him more and more. God bless you as you make that most important decision to trust Christ, to love him with your heart, soul, mind, and strength. I'm the pastor of Grace Community Church. We meet every Sunday morning at 9.30 at Saxe Middle School in New Canaan, Connecticut. Simply take the Merritt Parkway to exit 37, go to the end of the ramp, take a left onto Route 124, go approximately one mile, and take a right into Saxe Middle School. I would love to personally invite you to join us this Sunday, 930 Saxe Middle School. Have a great day. Where's the truth in all the voices? Give me an answer. Don't waste my time. Tell it to me straight The truth is getting hard to find I have objections to what I've learned I have questions and concerns Give me an answer Don't waste my time Tell it to me straight The truth is getting hard to find I have objections to what I've learned I have questions and concerns.